What if uh, the president says, I want you to file such and such, or the president says, I don't want you to file such and such? Have any of you been in such a position or a similar position? What does the Solicitor General do? The Solicitor General does work for the president. Uh, how about you, uh, Judge Starr? And have you ever been overruled? Yes. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, it's not pleasant, uh, but it does uh, remind you that uh, under uh, our architecture, uh, only the president uh, is elected and the vice president is elected by we, the people. The executive power is vested in the president, uh, and so you know who the boss is. Uh, the boss will show prudence, uh, regardless of uh, his party, and will allow the Solicitor General's office to operate uh, with great professional uh, independence. Uh, otherwise, there will uh, be great cost to the administration uh, in terms of rule of law kinds of values. But there are instances when the president uh, feels uh, that the Solicitor General's office is about to take or has taken a position. Uh, so let me just be very concrete. Uh, in a civil rights case uh, involving the remedial, well, there was also a liability issue, but there's no squabble in that regard that uh, the state of Mississippi had not taken sufficient uh, steps to dismantle its prior de jure segregated system of higher education. The question is, all right, liability obtains, but what do we do in terms of remedy? Uh, and so the brief that we uh, fashioned uh, collaboratively uh, within the executive branch spoke to uh, the remedy in ways that caused concern and consternation among the presidents of historically black colleges. Uh, the presidents uh, had uh, a direct pipeline to the president of the United States, President Bush 41, who had served on uh, the board uh, of an historically black college and had just a great sense of concern and kinship uh, with uh, those colleges. Uh, and so the decision was made without a lot of opportunity on the part of the Solicitor General to be heard to take out in the reply brief uh, to uh, rectify and to walk away from a passage in the brief with respect to what the appropriate remedy should be. Uh, so not surprisingly, when the oral argument came, and the oral argument's going along very nicely, the always uh, lively Justice Scalia uh, held up two briefs. He said, uh, General, I, I, I've read your opening brief and, and, and I have your reply brief. Uh, 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 which represents the position of the United States? <laughs> I believe that I mumbled something like, the reply brief, Your Honor, and if the court has no further questions, then you try to, to, to duck. Uh, and there I thought the president was, uh, was acting in the highest uh, and noblest uh, uh, traditions of the chief magistrate uh, determining what the position of the United States should be, but he shouldn't do it every day uh, or even perhaps every year. But there are times when the president should step in and the executive power should be exercised by the president. Now, if it is such a consequential matter that the Solicitor General cannot in conscience accept that amendment, then the honorable thing to do is, is at the appropriate time to resign from office because, as FDR told Mr. Humphrey of Humphrey's executor, we just had a session on this, our minds do not go along together. But I don't think a Solicitor General in our history has resigned as a matter of principle. Uh, Ken is too modest uh, to add that in the event in the Mississippi higher education case, his position and not the president's was vindicated by the Supreme Court. That's great. Go ahead, Drew. Marsha, I, I had a job interview with President Clinton in the Oval Office, and I was ready for a very linear interrogation uh, by the president it turned out to be a, just a kind of an Arkansas conversation. Uh, but during our discussion, uh, at one point he looked at me and he said, what is the relationship between the Solicitor General and the President? And I said, it's very simple, Mr. President. You are in the Constitution. The Solicitor General is not. He really liked that answer, apparently. <laughs> 
Well, it came back to haunt me. Uh, let me give you one example. And I, I think the remarkable thing is when presidents do intercede, it is very rare, very unusual, and I think happens only a few times in any administration. But uh, there was something called the Re Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And uh, the president was very much in favor of its terms and how it protected the interests of certain people. Well, we had a case in which there was a conflict between the bankruptcy code and the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It involved a, a couple, a very uh, a poor couple. Uh, they wanted to give their last nickels and dimes to their church. And the assertion was that that would be in violation of the bankruptcy code because it, it was in contemplation of declaring bankruptcy. Well, we in the department came to the conclusion that the bankruptcy code should prevail and went according to, to that decision for several months. Uh, the night before the uh, argument in the Court of Appeals in that case, I was told by a person in the White House to remain in my office until further notice. Uh, I knew the president had actually been meeting with some religious organizations who were also very concerned about the matter. And uh, I called a lawyer from the civil division who was already down in St. Louis uh, waiting for instructions. I said, just wait there. I think something's going to happen. And the word from the, the White House was, you are not to file the brief. You are not to argue in that case. So I called the lawyer, and I told him what the president had decided. And I said, well, if you don't want to sign the document withdrawing and saying that we're not going to engage in oral argument, he said, no. I'm a government lawyer, and I work for the President of the United States, and I will do this because it's my job. I, I was very moved by his response, and I said, well, that's fine. I, I really appreciate your professionalism. So tomorrow, go into the clerk's office with a letter that I'm faxing to you, sign it, toss it on the desk, and get the hell out of town, uh, <laughs> which he did. I'm told that during the oral argument, one of the judges remarked on the absence of a lawyer for the United States and rolling his eyes skyward, he said, I guess he got instructions from on high. <laughs> <laughs> and there, too, I thought the president was perfectly within his rights to do what he did. Yeah, I think the president absolutely has that right. I mean, the one thing I would say is that uh, it's really remarkable the degree to which the Solicitor General and that office enjoys autonomy both within the Department of Justice and within the executive branch. I mean, we're talking about the rare examples here today, and I think we've all had them. Uh, I actually worked on a brief, um, which I, I believe caused some consternation with the White House, where we ultimately filed the brief, and then the Vice President of the United States joined an amicus brief on the other side. <laughs> so that was quite unusual. Um, and, you know, we've all had the moments, I think, and I've had it, where the Attorney General has uh, walked into my office and said, you know, you file the brief that you think is right. And, and that's, what, that's what the lawyers in the office do, you know, ultimately with the caveat that the President gets to have his say. But, but again, I think um, that you do have discussions from time to time with the White House that usually involve lawyers in the uh, counsel's office or the counsel to the president. Um, but by and large, there really is a remarkable degree of the lack of oversight um, of the Solicitor General and the positions that they are taking in that office. Um, I just wanted to mention one other category of cases. I mean, there, there are some, um, and particularly the, in the post-9-11 uh, era, the president being commander in chief, um, I, I, the, the um, legal positions and the, and the development of, of uh, uh, legal regimes within the executive branch have been so tied up with the, with the, um, the president's exercise of his constitutional authority that, that I think from the outset there was, there was uh, a lot of involvement uh, across the board at those levels, uh, particularly in the early, uh, in the early years. So that, that, the, it, that's an example, I guess, of what Greg was talking about earlier, where even if the president's not a named party, uh, the, the, the president's interests are more um, acutely present than they might be in a, in a, in a case that is in an agency somewhere of an, of an administrative law. Uh, type. I don't want, want to suggest that the president is personally involved in, in, in frankly, very many of them, but, I, but, I, but I, think he, I think he's made aware of them and the people around him are, are made aware of the positions as they unfold 
to a much greater extent than in, in other areas. So you really, uh, one of my questions was going to be whether uh, you have a responsibility to tip off the president or the White House when there is a controversial position that you will be taking. Uh, but in general, would you say, Ed, that the White House uh, knows uh, what's coming, uh, the, that you're in enough, you have enough of a relationship uh, either through the Attorney General or others that uh, they know that that's something controversial may be happening. Is that, is that right? I, I think that's right. I mean, if you're doing your job, they know. The last thing you want is a call from the White House saying, you did what? Um, so uh, I think that's right. And, and I think it's, I mean, importantly, it, it, it's not a question of asking permission. It's, it's a question of making sure that they're in the loop so that they won't be surprised. And if they have concerns or issues that they want to discuss, that, that would take place. Well, that's an interesting point because uh, it would have been improper under the protocol, protocol under President Bush 41 for anyone at the White House to call the Solicitor General's office. Uh, they would call the Attorney General or the Deputy Attorney General. And this was part to uh, insulate uh, the Solicitor General in this sort of zone or cocoon of uh, operational, not theoretical, <clears throat> but operational uh, autonomy. Uh, that protocol was violated uh, once, uh, uh, and it was the exception that, that proved the rule when I was called by uh, the counsel to the president after a brief had been filed, and it simply was, and he said, I've told the attorney general that I'm placing this call, uh, are you sure of the position that you're taking in this case? It was a very wildly controversial case, not a social issues, but an interpretation of, of federal law. Uh, and uh, I said with uh, a lawyer's uh, uh, optimism, Boyden, I am absolutely certain that we're correct on the merits. I can never predict what the Supreme Court of the United States is going to do, but I'm absolutely convinced personally that we're correct. And then when I hung up the phone, I said, you know, you better win this one, Buster. <laughs> this is the, <clears throat> and happily we did, uh, the position we, uh, we uh, took uh, prevailed nine to nothing, but it was very difficult for some of the president's uh, constituencies. And so what happens is the losers uh, in the legal war uh, will then repair through their allies uh, to uh, the president of the United States, uh, through the political uh, process. Uh, my favorite example, may I go on, was, uh, uh, not in the SG's office at all, but it, uh, it, it reflects uh, the fact that uh, occasionally the White House will be m moved to seek to at least inquire, but it, even an inquiry from the White House can truly be viewed, I think, reasonably as interference, especially if it's a criminal investigation. And so the call came in, this is in the Reagan administration, hey, we're, I understand the U.S. Attorney in Los Angeles is investigating the following three people. Uh, General Smith, uh, you know, the, what's going on here? So you have to protect the integrity of the criminal investigation. You have to protect the integrity of the rule of law generally. So as his then chief of staff, it fell to me to very gently inquire into Jack Keeney and others. We're well, just trying to find out some basic information of what's underway, and it came back. And so the attorney general's report back to the White House was, you're right, we're investigating them. We think they're a bunch of crooks. To which the White House's reply was, but Bill, they're our crooks. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's very important, and, I, and this has been the practice through many administrations to have points of contact between the White House and the Justice Department so not everybody in the White House feels that he or she is a junior president and can call the Justice Department to get all kinds of information. As Griffin Bell, the Attorney General I first served under, used to say, the White House is a place, not a person. Who in the White House is calling? <laughs> and uh, made it very clear that if any calls came from the White House that seemed to intrude upon the jobs that we were doing, we would simply report it to the Attorney General. So my experience has been that the communication is generally between the White House, the President's office, counsel to the President, and the Deputy Attorney General or the Attorney General. Uh, beyond that, I think it gets into very complicated uh, waters, very deep waters in terms of uh, independence. 